Hey everyone, welcome to She's a 10 Ziquad. I am Lori and I have my usual suspects. We've got Michelle Immick, who is editor in chief of Ask Us Beauty Magazine, and my co host. Hey there. Hey there. Hey, <laughs> I, you know, I always like to sing. You, Hello. She's a songbird. And I've got Randy Crawford, who is a Jay Shetty certified life coach. And my Let's personal, go. <laughs> yeah, and my personal life coach. You better believe it. Hi, hi, and then Alicia. I thought that I would let you do the honors of introducing yourself because you have a very unique and passionate hook with one of the topics we're talking today. So I'm going to give you the floor to introduce yourself and what you do and why you're here in Studio 50 because it's awesome. Thank you, Lori and Michelle and Randy. Awesome to be with you today. Um, you got my name. It's up on screen, um, but I'm Alicia Merlo, and I wear a lot of shoes um, in life, but um, the one I'm most passionate about and finding myself most comfortable in is um, focusing on the area of human trafficking, and this is a hot topic. Um, it's been a topic um, that I have been involved in for four plus years in doing community advocacy, education, and prevention um, here in San Diego County, but I work with national organizations, and so I'm representing kind of the average Jane citizen who learns about something she becomes passionate about and figures out how to make a difference. Um, so that's kind of where I come into this conversation, and I thank you all for just having this not just once but multiple times because there's so much to unpack here and I'm really honored to be here with you guys. Wow. You kind of made us look bad with that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, so if it's not blinding flash of the obvious, one of the things that we're going to talk about coming off an amazing interview that we released this past Monday with Rachel C. Thomas who is both a human trafficking survivor educator and she's also a, one of the best advocates for getting awareness about the issues we're going to talk about that we're going to also talk about kind of the serendipitous ecosystem around um, the release of the rachel c thomas episode and the movie sound of freedom okay got a lot of controversy going on there we are also going to talk about this big umbrella of forgiveness because it's something that a lot of us women espouse and proselytize, but what really is that? And is there a right or wrong way to go about it? And then we're going to have a little fun talking about the Golden Bachelor. All right, <laughs> let's go. Okay, let's go. All right. So before I get started and kind of take her around the horn on the human trafficking side, I wanted to bring up and do kind of my own little PSA. Okay. So we released probably six weeks ago, an episode where Michelle and I interviewed the district attorney of San Diego, Summer Steffen, who is like four foot 10, but a sledgehammer, my favorite term, right? And she talked about the drug epidemic that's national here in the US and in particular San Diego and her footprint is rather large. And one of the things that we talked about was fentanyl. Okay, so we released that on a Monday. On a Wednesday, I got a phone call that one of my son's teammates brothers overdosed on fentanyl, completely unexpected, completely tragic and another underscore of how it can affect any family and anyone at any time. So if you have not listened to that episode or watched Summer in Action talk about fentanyl crisis, you need to do it and you need to have your kids do it and your young adults do it. And the one thing that I thought was really empowering and, and powerful was when we walked out of the memorial service, which I just attended this past week, they gave us, and Summer talks about this, it's called Narcan. I don't know if you can see it there. So Narcan nasal spray. So I have mine. You need to get yours. There's my PSA and listen to our fantastic district attorney from San Diego talk about what we need to know. All right, that's it. My my work here is done. I'm popping out, guys. Have good, good luck with the rest of the show. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, 
So let's talk human trafficking. As you know, from the top of the show, Alicia is going to be our our North Azimuth on this because she is in underneath the hood and in the weeds of all of this stuff on, on the daily, on the regular. So you listen to the episode, Alicia. What is your take? And is there anything you want to underscore or add from the episode with Rachel Thomas? Well, I think first and foremost, you did the right thing by starting a conversation with the survivor. Uh, because here in the movement, we call it the anti-trafficking human, human, anti-human trafficking movement. You can't have a conversation that's not survivor-led or survivor-informed. It's their experience. And they actually refer to themselves, as you probably learned, as lived experience experts. So I think what I loved about what Rachel shared was, you know, not just, you know, hey, I've experienced this myself and her story, which gives her that, you know, firsthand, you know, opportunity to talk to us about it, but also she empowered us and equipped us with ways that we can get involved, right? Her five things, right? Um, and I really thought everybody loves a list. They can check those things off on a list. And I think that that was really powerful. And she didn't sugarcoat anything, but she also didn't make it in a way to where it's so scary and overwhelming that we as parents or we as citizens, you know, um, who want everybody to live a free life um, should should be concerned about. So I thought she did a great job and you brought that out in her um, in, from her just beautifully. Thank you. Um, yeah, I thought, I think what's... <laughs> What the message that I really liked, and Michelle, I know you're going to agree with this, is she comes across as someone so relatable and articulate and polished, and it's such a dichotomy of the stereotype of person that we think would get entrapped into this world. Would you not agree, Michelle? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this episode, I had so many people reach out to me that have listened to the episode, and uh, I think what really meant the most was I had several people say that they had listened to it with their children and opened up the conversation. And so that, I mean, really that's what this platform is all about is about being able to, you know, shine a light on some of these topics and then, you know, people can listen and learn. So I, it was powerful. I think that she came across exactly what you said, so articulate and, and people were leaning in saying, wow, you know, cause I, I think they have a certain look in mind of what they think someone's supposed to look like or sound like that's trafficked. And, um, you know, so, so it was really, really great to see that feedback. Yeah. I think we all get the, uh, the visual of, a, of a troubled young adult or adolescent is, is the one that's vulnerable. So Alicia, and, and then I'm going to throw it to you, Randy, because then we're going to, we're going to talk about sounds of freedom because that is the, the, on the tip of everyone's tongue. And in fairness, I couldn't even get in to see the movie when I tried to. So I, I'm still trying to get my schedule and tickets aligned here. But what do you think about um, what Rachel said about the stereotypes and think, like, I'm really curious as what have you experienced in your world and in your work with regards to that? Well, I think I came to human trafficking like most of us do, the Hollywood version, right? Mm -hmm. The Taken, right? Liam Neeson and Taken. And this is where it happens somewhere else and not right here where we live. And when I dove deeper into this, my eyes were really open. And I like to say I was almost shattered to understand this. This happens to um, anybody. Nobody is, you know, um, free from the risk of being trafficked. And this Hollywood um, aspect of just being kidnapped or abducted is just one way that people become entangled and exploited. And even if Rachel's story where she was kind of like this, you know, false job opportunity with the modeling, right? Um, or boyfriending. So, so what I learned and what surprised me most is that when it's happening, it's not happening to where somebody is, you know, kidnapped off their front yard or they're tricked into, you know, um, something that is, you know, um, to go somewhere and then abducted, um, which happens in the sound of freedom. It does happen. That is a reality. But I think we need to arm ourselves. And I learned that being aware of the multitude of ways that we can get into that, if you want, that somebody can be exploited and victimized, it, it's not a quick and, you know, kind of snatch and grab. A lot of times it's a methodological um, approach by these exploiters and perpetrators to groom, we've heard this word, mm -hmm. right? Groom mm -hmm. their victims to believe that they're in a relationship and become something that it's not until this that switch flips a little bit like um, like Rachel shared with it with the modeling agency experience. Yeah. And she and then I she had she stated on there 50% of 
children trafficked, I don't know if it's just children, but trafficked is uh, based on cell phone, social media usage. Yeah, yeah on, a, online stuff. Access. Yeah, there's unlimited access that we give. We invite these people in. We invite these people into our own personal lives as adults, and we actually invite them into the lives of our children. So that is a very powerful statement. And that access, and since the pandemic, because more young people, and even us, right, we're on social media and all these platforms, because there was nothing else to do, um, really, you know, almost triple the incidence of child sex trafficking and exploitation. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, what you said was so true, because I've, I've heard it now from Rachel multiple times, is these predators are very savvy. It is methodological. And they are patient. They will do go through a process of separating you from your support system in a very patient and a savvy way that is frightening. And, and it, it could be happening when your kid is in their bedroom and you think they're safe, right? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the flip side of this and let's talk the movie. All right, Randy, you were the first one to, I mean, you've kind of, you, you saw it and then brought it up. Let's go. What's your thoughts? Well, first, I just want to add to the Rachel piece because I thought you guys did such an incredible interview with her. And it, the reason that interview I thought was so amazing is because that to me, I think it was her second point. There is no stereotypical abuser and trafficker and there's no stereotypical because I kept thinking to myself how did this happen to this girl like I was thinking she had been much younger I didn't know the story and you know she got taken in through the modeling agency and that's what happened in the sound of freedom so the sound of freedom is fascinating to me and I will be very open and honest and say that it's sort of been like an arc with me because I got you know I do my TikToks before bed and one night my whole TikTok was Sound of Freedom. I had never heard of it, didn't know what it was. I ended up saying to my husband, we should go see this. I wasn't even excited to see it and we're huge movie people. I went to see it at a theater where there's a really nice bar so that if I thought there was gonna be any scenes I couldn't watch, because I cannot and will not watch animals and or children be abused. I was like, I'll go and I'll I'll get a drink or a, or a Topo Chico. Um, <laughs> So we see the movie. I didn't have to leave to get a drink. I thought the movie, the movie itself is incredible. So that's to me, not, not the argument at all. I think that it does what it needs to do in terms of raising awareness that this is going on. But here's what's very interesting about the marketing of that and how I got taken in and I became judgmental and now I'm backing way off. I feel like when I initially told people I was going to see this, I had certain people say, I will not see that. It was written by QAnon, a hard no. And then I got really mad at them. And I'm like, well, that, what? You don't care about sex trafficking? Like, how could you, you know? So I immediately became defensive. Like, do, are you not a human? You know, and I fell right into that. I admit it. After I saw it, I said to my friends, you guys, this movie is incredible. If nothing else, just see the movie. It raises awareness. But then I... I continue to watch, you know, get, you know, kind of go down the rabbit hole a little bit. And I, listen, at the end of the day, the lead actor in the movie, I think he's QAnon. I mean, he's absolutely certifiable. And the things that he says on this press tour are are really quite cringe. I mean, it's, it's hard to watch this movie be um, advocated for by the people that are running it because that is, is very hard to stomach. But if you were to ask me net-net at the end of the day, I loved the movie. I thought it was great. I thought it was done very classy. I did not have to walk out of that movie. You imagined things, but they didn't show anything. And I think if you're doing anything to raise awareness um, for child sex trafficking, then you're doing a good thing. Do I love all the people involved? Nope, it's gotten a little weird for me. But <laughs> you know, there's also Scientologists that are running the movies, right? Right, And they're, I think that they've got some wacky, you know, ideations as well. I can't be behind every single person that's on the screen, but I am certainly behind the message that this needs to be addressed and um, and our, we just need to be aware of it. And I hope that, you know, more stuff is done to stop it because it is, just makes you want to vomit even talking about it. The whole, the whole subject is really hard to stomach. Yeah. Okay, Alicia, you saw it the day it came out. 
and what's your analysis? And then you had some on the phone, you had some interesting takes on some of the hubbub surrounding the release of the, the motion picture. Um, and I'd like to get your takes on that as well. Uh, yeah. And R Randy, I thank you for being candid and sharing your experience, like that journey you went on. And I think that a lot of people will be able to relate to that. And because I've been a part of this work for so many years, I have a little bit of a different lens and I'm happy to be able to share that. One of the things that I, I see is exactly what you honed in on. The issue is still an issue and it's, it's not fabricated. It's not made up. Human trafficking is the second largest criminal enterprise in the world. Um, it is the fastest growing children. Millions of them are being exploited as well as adults all throughout the country. And our nation is driving the demand. But when I look at what's happening around this film, I get encouraged by the awareness and people getting empowered. And then I see the other side of how it's become polarizing. And that's our culture today, really. It's just everything, whether it's supposed to be neutral as a topic can very quickly be polarizing for groups. And then we find ourselves focused on what's being said over here and not really the intention of the movie. So my recommendation is what you and where you ended up landing. Yes, that can be a part of it and a distraction, but stay away. Don't be distracted by the drama. Focus on the crime, focusing on what we can do to understand, no, yes, this exists. Now we know about it. What are we going to do about it? And, you know, and learning more about how we can be empowered and equipped because no matter who's behind it, you never know all the way up the food chain for anything that's presented to us in the media, that, that this is a real issue. This is based on a real story and somebody's journey. And we want to focus on that. Um, piece of it and how we as a nation and as global citizens can try to make a difference in our own backyards where is where we start. Yeah. Amen to that. All right, Michelle, you've seen it too. Anything else you want to, something surprise you about it? Or did you learn something different than, you know, coming off Rachel's interview? Yeah. Um, the United States is the number one consumer of child pornography. Yep. So I don't, I don't give two flying Fs about if someone's part of QAnon or what QAnon, is. I don't care. What I care about is that we're bringing awareness to something like this because it is, it's gut-wrenching. It really is. As a mother, like I just, I, I felt watching that movie, um, uh, one of our contributors at Ask Us Beauty, um, Ellie Landry, her husband was the writer and director of the film. Um, so it's obviously close to me in there. I thought he did a beautiful job, uh, but I just, it, it bothers me. I've been on so many of these quads where I've talked about the media and the sound bites and what is put out there and how it, how it divides us in this culture war. Um, it shouldn't be political. None of that stuff matters. It just doesn't. It, what matters is how can we make a difference? That's it. Oh, drop the mic on that one, sister. Let's go, little mama. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. And, you know, but I'm, I'm in the flip side, too, is like, you know, it, it, this the traditional Hollywood and press and media bullshit that, you know, they take every opportunity to use their platform to use, you know, proselytize some agenda. And I think that's the case here as well. But I think all of you have so brilliantly articulated the fact that the issue needs to be illuminated. And this movie does a lot of that. Can I just ask your, your guest one question, because this is what you do. And this was my overriding feeling when I left the movie. And this is what I, I truly don't understand. You have a chubby white dude getting on an airplane with a young, adorable five to 11 year old child that is not a white child that doesn't even speak a word of English. How does that happen every single day and nobody, I mean, I get that people don't want to be racial profiling, but I'm going to racially profile every damn time I get on a plane if I were to see that. Are we not training staff to maybe pull people aside and say to this little boy, you know, first ask him if he speaks English. He says no. That might raise a red flag. Why is that not? This is, you know, again, the way you watch the movie, it just seems like an obvious. How are we letting that happen? Great question. And I think we've evolved in um, educating, especially those that work in the industries like hospitality and travel, of what to be aware of. There are organizations out there 
dedicated to training the employees. If you ever go into a restroom in the airport, do you ever see the signs in there? Are you a victim of human trafficking in like 10 different languages in the bathroom? Yep, yep same um, here. And back then, you have to think that's not present day. So that's over a decade ago. And to give you a timeline about the crime of human trafficking, human tra trafficking was not recognized as a crime by the United Nations till the year 2000. That seems like to me, and I'm in my fifth day, that, that seems like last week um, to me. So we've made progress. And currently, there is a huge push to educate the masses out there. There's an amazing organization called It's a Penalty. I don't know if you've heard about them. They're out there. They focus on educating industry. So the, um, the Uber and Lyft drivers, the hotel workers, the convention hall people, um, airlines, um, all those that can be the eyes and ears to help identify and report um, somebody who may be being exploited. So, so it's out there. And I'm so glad that you like cued in on that, Randy, because it's a good question. What can we do if we see people? Um, and then from us, right, the citizens, the fellow passengers on the plane, this movie and this conversation is where it starts. So what do we do next? I feel uncomfortable. We also have this like mind your business mentality, yeah. I think, um, yeah. you know, that you, you never know and it's awkward, like, because, but rather that you would be wrong in reporting something than be miss something that could have saved somebody's life. And, and I think that's something we have to be bold about to your point, Michelle, you know, we, we need to do something and we need to speak up. Um, there's another campaign that they do through an organization called A21, it's called, Do You See Me? Mm -hmm. And their campaign is focused on what we can look for also through these visual experience about looking at a child that doesn't look like, you know, maybe a family member or English speaking or looks uncomfortable or is avoiding eye contact, doesn't know to speak, doesn't have control of their identification. So many resources are out there that are just at our fingertips to be able to find this out and get connected on what to do. Thank I you. did take I did take an online um, course so that I could identify um, some areas to, you know, just for more awareness. That was a few years ago during COVID. I took that, but, um, yeah, I think that it's just, that's the takeaway. Right. But I, I don't know if this, I thought I, I thought I read that they said 80,000 unaccompanied minors came through the border last year. Is that give me that question? <laughs> so, but I mean, um, that's like crazy to me. So, like, I'm like, so okay, so children are just coming over with no so if we look at the millions of people who have come into our country through the, through the, the means that's a hot topic at our southern border in particular, um, what has been reported is that they've lost track of tens of thousands of these unaccompanied minors and the systems in place were not equipped or resourced to be able to support that influx of people and especially unaccompanied minors. And so I think that um, without getting political, that there are a lot of people that need to do a better job in how we protect those who come to us, not of their own desire, but are sent here with the hopes of the dream of living in America, yeah. right? And they are usually sent unaccompanied under false pretenses by bad actors um, that are doing a human smuggling. And that is a whole other crime, very separate from human trafficking and something people should learn about. Okay. Wow. All right. Well, I feel really good that we're doing our part here. And I applaud uh, Rachel because I, you know, as I said in the episode, you know, sometimes we go through traumatic experiences and what we do is we put it in our rear mirror and move forward. And um, she's taking it on and she's very brave. And um, I think that making the movie was very brave. I So I applaud that too. And I, can, I can't wait to see it. A shameless plug for, for another movie that's really good, two other movies, if you really want to learn. Um, there's one called um, um, Nefarious Merchant of Souls. It's a documentary that was done a few years ago and actually follows trafficking all around the globe. It lands up here in the United States. And the other one was put together by Operation Underground Railroad, actually the same people who kind of put together Tim Ballard's team um, called It's Happening Right Here, which is focused, you guys, on San Diego. Oh, wow. So have, I um, wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Like, I literally, no, thank you. <laughs> but this Come is on, how, Randy. how we learn. And, you know, you say, how do we learn? What do we know what to look for? Um, it is scary, Randy. I, I agree, but we don't make a difference if we don't figure out what we can do, you know? And I know, yeah. I know. 
And I saw, I did see it. So at the end of the movie, the last two minutes, it says stay around for, you know, a message. And so, and I did see Randy that some people had differences of opinions. Like some people thought that was great. You buy a ticket, you can buy tickets for someone else to see it. And then I saw other people kind of making comments like that's awful, but there's other ways that you could use that money. If you didn't want to, you know, buy a ticket for someone, you could put that money to shelters and homes for for people. So there's a lot of different ways that you can make a difference for people that have, that are survivors of trafficking. Yeah. Okay. Great job, ladies. You've done good. Okay. Next topic. This should be fun. Um, <laughs> forgiveness. And, you know, Randy and I have spoken about this and the reason why I want to talk about it is I think it's a big hairball of a word that has a lot of connotations and we see it everywhere. Uh, you cannot go on social media for a day, especially if you're a woman and not see a quote about forgiveness. And so, it, and I kind of, you know, went through some of the, the big ones. Okay. So we have, you know, to err is human to forgive is divine. There is no love without forgiveness. It's not something you do for someone else. It's something you do for yourself. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Forgive and forget, okay? So I'm gonna start with you on this one, Randy. Um, what is your thought and what is your lens on forgiveness? Well, it's funny. Um, I actually wrote down a couple of quotes too. <laughs> I have Martin Luther King who said, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He his he who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. And then another favor to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Um, it's an interesting take I have, especially Lori as a life coach, but you know, we're all like who we are is how we grew up. And I grew up with a father who uh, he had what he called a 10 year rule. And if somebody crossed him, he literally cut them out for 10 years. I kid you not. 10 years to the day, 10 years later, all was forgotten, all was forgiven. And they were like best buddies again. And I grew up watching this, you know, and I've certainly never cut anyone off for 10 years, but I will tell you this much. I see like what Martin Luther King here says, you're, you're devoid of the power to love. I, I respectfully disagree with that statement. I think that there are some things that people can do to you that if I do believe we need to let it go. I think mm -hmm. there's a difference between letting it go and forgiving. I have people in my life who have done things to me, very few, that are unforgivable. It doesn't mean that I haven't had the ability to let it go, but you know, letting it go and holding on to it is a very different thing than, than forgiveness, in my opinion. So I, I all these quotes, I think, compound sand. I think you have to live your life in a way that makes you happy. And if you don't have it in you to forgive someone, but it doesn't mean that I think you need to hold on to it because if you are holding on to it, it is hurting you. You are in fact that prisoner. So you have to strike that balance. But I do, I have two that I'll, I'll not forget what they did to me. And, um, you know, and if it's brought up, I get riled up. If it's not brought up, I'm perfectly okay with it. So I do, I think it's a big word and I, I just don't go with all the quotes. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to bounce it down to you, Alicia, in a second. I, I'm kind of with you, Randy, is I've had a lot of time to think about this. And I don't know. I, I think there's some things that you, that you, like you said, are unforgivable. That doesn't mean that you can't try to work through them and push them aside and try to find the space of compassion and love. But I think in order you can forgive and not what is it forget and not forgive or whatever I'm kind of in that lens um where I, I don't I think there's a couple things that have been done to me that I think are unforgivable and I don't think it makes me a bad person that I don't want to forgive because I feel like if I forgive then I fall victim to maybe another situation like that and um I don't know all right so Alicia you had told me you are a woman of faith this is forgiveness is it's got so many biblical like tentacles here. What's your take? Yeah, I'm a woman of faith now, but I always wasn't. I'm also a natural born Jersey girl. So like your dad, you 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 wronged me. You were cut out. Like you mm -hmm. were cut off, cut out. 
and there was no 10 year rule. And so I really walked around for many of much of my life is like offended and holding grudges. And, and what I saw that did to me in my relationships. And then also personally, it just, it, it, when I reflect upon that now, it's like, wow, I don't even know if I'd hang out with me. Um, but since I became a woman of faith over the last decade of my life, I have learned what forgiveness does for me to your point, right? It's not for anybody else. It's not saying what that person did to you is okay. By all means, no. Yep. And there are certain ways that you have to realize that forgiveness is also, it doesn't mean you have to have reconciliation and invite that person who has harmed you back into your life. But forgiveness releases you from the bitterness, the pain, the prison cell, however you want to discuss, to take to take root in your heart. Because when you let things that are negative take root in your heart, then out of the heart, everything else flows. And I found when I was living in unforgiveness and the land of being offended by everybody, I was a bitter person. And I, I love the, the saying like, you know, um, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die or, you know, lighting yourself on fire and expecting them to die of smoke inhalation, like all of those things. And I found by the grace of God, because I have sinned and I have needed to, needed forgiveness in many ways um, that I found freedom in that. And I found it very freeing. And, and that's where my take is. But I agree. Doesn't mean you have to reconcile and invite that person who harmed you back into your life. And it does not mean that they are free from the responsibility of the acts that they have done or the things that they have said that were extremely hurtful. So that, that's kind of my take on it. Okay, let me ask you this. And, and Michelle, you take this one on. So what you just said is very powerful, by the way, Alicia. But I guess, I guess what I'm struggling with, again, is the word. So you're not forgetting and you're not holding them any less accountable for the actions or intentions that they had. You're not forgetting it because you want to learn your lesson. So what is forgiveness? I, mean, I love still, that question. I'm thinking you're, maybe still, thing. you're still holding on to, you're still, your heart is still saying, this is where my moral azimuth is going. And, and let's say, I think one of the worst things you can do to someone, honestly, in my opinion, is betrayal. When you betray them, it is, that is a bitter pill to swallow and one to one that's really, really hard to let go of and forgive and forget. Right. So that being said, I, there's a couple betrayals that have happened um, to me and I'm, and I'm not alone in this world on that one. Right. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no forgiveness. Because to me, that word is like, I, if I forgive, then I, then I'm kind of letting myself off the hook of, uh, so take that on Michelle. I don't know. Oh, just no, no big deal. I, you know, I was just thinking when it was like, forgive and forget, I was like, forgive and you're dead to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, to me, it's, I, when it comes to forgiveness, I, time is, is the friend on my end. So I have to step away from whatever that is and just, mm -hmm. I have to let it go personally. And then I, I find in time I can rationalize it, maybe step in and go, okay, what, what was going through the mind of this person or whatever the situation is, because I can't think rationally when it's happening. I'm angry and I'm like, yeah, you know, go of course. up yourself, like you're, you're done. But then, then it's, then the rationalization steps in and I'm like, okay, let me come from a place of understanding. Um, but I think that that takes time. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if you ever find complete forgiveness. I think you just work through it and you try to find some peace and, um, especially when it comes to relationships, I think sometimes you really have to evaluate, is this someone, if someone is that, that you love and is going to do something that's going to hurt you, depending on the scale of what it is, does this person stay in your life? Or is this someone that you, you know, you remove and, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the mindset I go, go through. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, again, I think Randy, you said it, I, I, something's I think it's okay for us to also let ourselves off the hook and give ourselves grace and say, some things are unforgivable. Doesn't mean you hang on to them. Doesn't mean that you manifest, you know, bad feelings within your heart. It just means you've recognized boundaries that um, no relationship can, can peacefully and harmoniously coexist. Well, and I do I think like that. I like that. I was going to say, I think a lot of people turn to their faith 
and they do mm-hmm. it with a lot of prayer and meditation and you know that they they walk through it that way like when it comes to the level of forgiveness like if there's somebody that was hurt someone i loved i i don't you know i don't think i could I, can, I, can i make an observation because i i love this conversation yes the that you are saying um about what leads you to not want to forgive something is actually all the acts that I said that that aren't required of forgiveness, letting them back in your life, saying what they did to you was okay, right? Um, build, you know, trying to, you know, um, you know, make sure that they, you know, make them feel better. All of forgiveness has to do with us. You all said though, I'm not going to hold on to it. I'm not going to let it affect me. I'm not going to let it damage how I see the world in that way. So in a, in a way, I'm like relating to him, like, I feel like I hear you guys all saying similar to what I was saying. I, you know, I've had betrayal in my life, right? The same thing. And I always say it's my choice to whether I want to let that person into my life or not, or set the boundaries or have learned from that experience and take it with me. So I don't relive it with somebody else. Oh, I think that's a good one. The set yeah. the boundaries. 100%. Yeah. I, I like this one. This is one that I I've seen many, many times from, um, from all the social media pundits. Did I just create a new term? <laughs> okay. Is I forgive you access denied. Huh? You like that one? Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah. So anyways, I wanted to talk about it because I think it's a big, big word that's used and in so many different ways. And um, I don't know. I, th- I thought it would be an interesting conversation because I, I feel like sometimes we're told to do certain things and, I don't know. I think it's, you're, you're also okay to give yourself grace and maybe, maybe at least for a bit of time, not forgive. Right. Well, you're made know. to feel guilty. I mean, this quote yeah. says, if you can't forgive, you're devoid of the power to love. Well, that's not true. Yeah. I have a lot of love. I also have some people who have betrayed me and that's just something that I refuse to forgive, but we're talking about it. If we weren't talking about it, they would not take up space they're not paying rent in my brain, but if we're going to talk about it, yeah, I got yeah. a couple. <laughs> we all yeah. got a couple. We got a couple, right? but I, I would agree that, you know, that's where I, I think I get very good at redirecting and com- compartmentalizing, but which, okay. So I'm going to bring this up and I didn't plan on it. So the other thing that you, you see a lot is self-forgiveness. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because that might be even harder. We beat ourselves up all the time about doing certain things. And and um, are we giving ourselves, maybe there's certain things that we should not forgive ourselves for doing. Maybe we're the betrayer, right? And are no, we just I don't even ourselves- know what you're saying. What do you mean? No, we always have to forgive no, ourselves. We, do, to give yeah, ourselves we have grace. to forgive ourselves. Yeah. Okay, I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> we have to- well, what, so you're saying you don't want to forgive your betrayer, Randy, but yet if you betray someone, you're gonna you're gonna give yourself a forgiveness hall pass? Yes, that's exactly. That's exactly what you're saying. All right, let's go. Am I out there betraying people? I mean, I'm trying to think of something unforgivable that I've done. That's an unforgivable act is a pretty big deal when you've yeah. done something really, really shitty. But the difference, Lori, is if I've done something epically terrible. I mean, like lowest of the low, you better believe my husband's going to call me on it and I'm going to come to you and say, you know what? Like, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness and you can say no, but I'm going to take accountability for that act. And that to me is giving myself grace. Whereas the the few in my life that are, that I just won't forgive have never owned what they did. Yeah. And that's different to me. So yeah. I do have people in my life that will call me out on my shit. Let me just say that. And I will own it. And I will always be the one to apologize. Yeah. I, I have the same type of husband. And, and I honestly, I have the same um, girl squad that will do the same. My friends are not, you know, weak by any stretch and they will mm-hmm. call my shit out. You know, I, I think that the, the issue I have, and Alicia, I'm going to say this and then we're going to close with you and then we're going to move on to something really wacky. Um, I think it's when someone has the intent to hurt you over and over and their actions. I mean, we all say hurtful words in, in a, a fit of anger um, or we say things we regret or when emotions get ahead of us or they 
take over your psyche. You start to, you know, you can do some hurtful things, but when someone has the intent to hurt you in, in a very conscious way, I think that's where I'm like, I don't know. Okay, Alicia, close us out on this one, woman of faith. Oh, goodness. Well, I'm just going to close you out with some definitions. Okay. So it's okay. I'm not opening all like it, but let's talk about mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is not getting what we deserve, right? Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And I think we all need a little bit of both to give it to others and get it and receive it. And also, to your point, allow ourselves to receive it from, from ourselves. So, so that would be like my closer. Just really thinking about those things, you know, mercy being not getting what we deserve and grace being getting something that we actually don't deserve. Is that why they say mercy? So they're not <laughs> getting, who says that anyway? What, what, what song is that? Mercy. Is it a Van Halen song? Okay, never mind. All right, <laughs> moving right along. Okay, let's talk about something fun and whimsical and I, I, you know, kind of interesting and it's everywhere right now. It's all over the place. We have Jerry Turner, bless his heart, 71 years old, is, call, is the first what they're calling golden bachelor. No, I don't know how I feel about this because, I mean, he looks great. I don't know how much of that is great lighting, camera angles, et cetera. But for 71, he looks friggin' fantastic. I'm thinking about the women coming onto this show. Are we going to have like young women? Are we going to have 65? To, are we going to have seniors on this show? And are, That's the are question. They gonna, are they going to be making out? I don't know. Someone tell me what's going to happen here. And, and Alicia, I know you don't watch TV. This I might have to, yeah, this, I have to look it up. This is <laughs> worth well, this one's this worth watching. You, this might yeah. convert you back to the, the, the small screen. So, Randy, what do you think about this? First of all, Lori, because I really don't watch The Bachelor, I've tried in the past. Someone said my husband looked like one of the bachelors, so we watched it one episode. I'm like, I don't understand how people watch this. This is such crap. But when I looked this up, when one of you sent it to me, first of all, the dude is into pickleball. So like, I want to see some good pickleball on this. We're going to have some picklers on there. That's going to be, it's, I'm going to check it out. We have to tune I, yeah. in. We have to. We have to. We have to. I feel the same way. Like I haven't watched the show since maybe the first season, which was, I don't even know, 20 years ago. And so this, I saw this and then immediately I just kind of chuckled to myself because I'm like, what is this going to be? Is it going to be women in their 20s and 30s? Is it going to be women you know, of, of the same age, what are we going to watch? So I, I think that I might have to tune in to the first episode. Um, kudos for them to, for finally coming up with something different, because I think that, and I guess obviously people still watch it because it's still on the air, but I don't know how, because I'm with you, Randy. Like I, I just was like, this is all sick. right. I, I just, I'm going to, I'm going to call it. <laughs> it <laughs> you know what? I, I am going to try. I haven't watched it since the episode of the bachelor where the girl came cruising in on a cupcake and then I thought this has just gone too far like her opening moment was she drove up in a cupcake a literal cupcake nice. um so I'm going to tune into the first when the arrival at least the arrival episode and damn it if there aren't a couple of walkers <laughs> women with walkers if I need some golden girls like yeah, we need some B. Arthur. I and, need B. Yeah. Arthur. I need I need some Mrs. Magoo glasses going on. If I don't, if I see all of these younger women, significantly younger women, or I see unrealistically, you know, unaged women, they're gonna hear about it. No, we want the knee braces. We want uh, the whole deal. Glasses, ooh, braces, they're, they're, walkers. Are they talking about of ages? This whole spectrum of stereotypes right, right now is making me itch. Like, you know, they're <laughs> going to have to be super old and be the stereotypical old lady in the mid, in my mid to late fifth decade. I'm going, ah, or they have to be like the trophy girlfriend. Well, um, that's why, like, I mean, the, I, they probably have a mix of all of them. I, I think we, but that's what we need to see. We need, we to, need see to see variety. We need to see variety. I was working on you guys. You're 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 hooked as a recovering reality TV addict. I will not be watching it, so I will be texting you guys and yes. asking yes. what's happening with Jerry and if he's found the lady love of his life. 
I yeah, think that's the point though. I mean, when you think about it, we, the comment is, wow, you know, people are like, wow, he looks really good for 71. Well, 71 looks great. I mean, a lot of people look fantastic. I think it's just a matter of that. It does need to show a true 70, you know, women, you know, women, let's say those are the, the people that are going to be on women in that age range that have different, different looks to them. Yes. There, there are some seventies in there that are have knee braces and you know yes. white hair and then you have the other ones that you know if they you know, all look like kathy hilton that's what i'm saying like, i'm gonna i'm not gonna be happy i hope there's a true depiction let's see some diversity going on in this yeah. uh this group of women this and, the and you know what i i will become super fan if jerry goes in for a smooch and someone's teeth fall out oh stop that <laughs> that'll be amazing <laughs> oh my god okay cool get knocked up on this show so yeah canceled okay so canceled. we just started this new thing and i think it's great and um i want to go around the horn and have everyone give their weekly rule to live by i'm gonna start with you michelle okay so mine is what you focus on you attract you attracted me. I did. And look it. I mean, what, what were you what? focusing on? I was focusing, focusing, focusing on. I got you all like, I got you Amazing, uh, you know, amazing friend and okay. uh, somebody okay. with, uh, that I can have fun with and learn from and all kinds of good stuff. Okay. That's a good one. I like that one. Okay. Randy, what about you? Mine's just going to be very simple this week. Just be nice. Oh yeah. I like that. <laughs> Okay, Alicia, if you, if you don't give us forgiveness, <laughs> yeah, give us mercy. Yes. You know we don't deserve. <laughs> You're all going to get what you don't deserve. Um, <laughs> no, I think it's um, for me, it's, you know, we all have something to give to someone else. So pick one person that you can give to each other, your time, your talent, your words of encouragement, because I guarantee you're going to get back so much more than, than they receive. So amazing. All right, I'm I'm coming in hard here, Randy. Hard yes on. If you're in a loving relationship, don't keep score. Okay, and that's a hard one because I think sometimes as humans we you know we ch check the boxes and and we tend to keep score. I'm saying no because if you're in a loving relationship with somebody, sometimes you're going to be giving more. And then sometimes you're going to be giving less and it all ends up equaling out over time. All right. Good one. You know what, Randy, I, I think, when am I going to get certified as a life coach after that? I don't know, but that's some yeah. deep stuff, Laura. That was deep. I know, we, we went there. All right. Thank every, thank you everyone for being with us this week. Alicia, you were um, an amazing fourth chair. Thank you so much for being here. And of course, Life Coach Randy, thank you for being with us and keeping us honest. And thank you. And Michelle, her in her pink box, lighting it up. You you thank were a sledgehammer you. today, girl. Oh, okay. I liked it. I you got a little spicy there on us, and I I it's much appreciated. Oh, okay. Well, good. Yeah. Okay, so we will catch you guys next week. And if you have not voted for She's a Ten podcast, it's linked in our bio we would so appreciate we work really really hard to, to do this show and there's a lot of great content providers that um are in the categories it's female hosted podcasts and it is people's choice we would love for you to check the box next to our name let's go all right next week bye ladies bye